what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to talk about these two artists that were uh, major figures in the Bauhaus and, uh, and then have a, a panel of a great, lo wonderful local artists who uh, work in this valley who uh, I, I believe have, have been affected by that Bauhaus. And we're going to listen to them, show their work, uh, some pieces of their work, and tell us how they might have been affected by the Bauhaus also. So they're, they're uh, and I realize they're not all painters. Um, <laughs> Marsha has informed me she's not a painter. She's a printmaker. And there's a print by Herbert Beyer over there. But a lot of us are familiar with the, with the, the, the painting of the Bauhaus through Herbert's work that, that as locals, but we're not so familiar with the Bauhaus in terms of uh, maybe some of the other uh, major painters that were involved. Okay, so I've, um, let's see, uh, uh, it's impossible to do justice to this huge topic in, in this short amount of time. So part of the other purpose of this is to whet your appetite, show you some pictures, uh, and introduce, and maybe you'll follow up and explore on your own about uh, how it may be perhaps your own, I see lots of artists here, how your own work might have been actually uh, affected. All right, I picked uh, Candency and Clay as the artists that we're gonna look at tonight. And um, they were great, not only great artists, but they were also revolutionary thinkers. And this is a really important thing. Kandinsky is often credited with having uh, basically uh, been the pioneer uh, for uh, abstract art. And when you think about the effect that abstract art has had uh, in general, uh, what a huge effect that has. They were, um, uh, part of, uh, they were, uh, as I say, revolutionary thinkers, but they weren't only, didn't only produce art, but they also wrote down their ideas and taught their ideas. And as a result, they had a very, very broad uh, uh, dissemination of their ideas. And people, and I have a, a couple of their books, which I'll uh, uh, put out after the, after the talk, th uh, that were the seminal pieces uh, of their, of their uh, writing. And that influenced everybody. Yeah. Can I have you hold the mic either a little further away or else we're going to turn it off? Okay. Just, it's popping. I think, what, I, you know, can people hear me? I'll talk pretty. Yeah. 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 Let's, yeah. let's go salon style. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so uh, when we think of the Bauhaus, we sort of, uh, we think of uh, rather methodical and uh, uh, the Germanic traits of very practical and methodical and scientific uh, uh, process. And yet we're going to look at two artists that were kind of the opposite of that. So one of the interesting things is why were these two people involved? What, what, why, why did Gropius select this particular kind of artist that weren't collaborators necessarily. They were talking about the individual artist and the relationship of their art and the soul, something that we don't really uh, associate with, with the Bauhaus. Uh, to his credit, he selected them because they combined, they were artists that combined the rational observation of reality with the inner, their inner selves and their soul. And I think that these concepts uh, form the basis of most great art, no matter what uh, period you're talking about. But I think that in, in the case of the Bauhaus, we've, we've too long you know, associated with Albers and maybe Herbert's very precise drawings and so on. And these guys made very messy and soulful work. Um, the books that they produced uh, were really uh, important. There was a, uh, one is by Clay called A Pedagogical Sketchbook. And in this book, he describes the experience of the dual reality of the seen and felt essence of nature impels the student toward a free creation of extracted forms which supersede didactic principles with the naturalness, the naturalness of the work. And what he's really saying is, is that, that the, the, the felt part 
of what is seen comes out in the painting and the work uh, as important as the reality of the work. And I think, uh, again, that, that resonated at the time, and I think it still does uh, currently. Uh, Kandinsky wrote concerning the spiritual in art. This was another seminal work that was distributed, translated, uh, and distributed all over the world. And uh, again, uh, Bougain, uh abstract art and the, 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 you know, disseminated the ideas of making paintings that weren't necessarily about something that you could recognize, but something that you could feel. So, uh, do we have a clicker? I don't. Yeah. Is this it? Oh, okay. To give you a little. All right. Do you want to sit or should I move this? No, I'll leave that and I'll be there when I'm done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here are the two subjects that we're going to begin with. And this is just to give you a little reminder, a little taste uh, of, of what the art scene at the Bauhaus. This is Kandinsky and Paul, uh, Wasily Kandinsky and Paul Clay, uh, the artists that I'm talking about. And Wassily was born in uh, Moscow. And uh, let's see, we'll get my Kandinsky thing. 1866, just to give you a, a time. A little bit after the Civil War, when you think of it, right? So, um, and he was raised a Russian Orthodox. He, uh, he went to the Moscow uh, School of Economics for his early education and became a lawyer. Uh, he didn't really focus on painting until he was 30 years old. And when he moved to uh, Munich, and he studied at the Academy of Fine Arts. And again, what was going on, art was taught in academies, and you were taught art by rote. You were taught art. Uh, and what, what he did was he, at that time, there were all sorts of revolutionary things going on, including the Russian Revolution, but the, the seeds of that. There was a lot of excitement in art, and he was uh, uh, part of the uh, of this sort of various movements. We're talking about 1911, right before the Russian Revolution, and he and another avant-garde group who were all bouncing off each other with tons of energy uh, started a group called the Blue Rider, and it was named after one of his paintings, and they held gatherings and organized shows of avant-garde painters. They, they included uh, uh, artists like Picasso in their shows in Munich and produced publications of Der Blue Rider Gazette where they talked about their ideas. And I, I, I think of that only, uh, talk about it, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful in a way if we could, uh, you know, as an artist community of all, all of us, start bouncing our ideas off each other with that kind of energy. It's just kind of a a hope of how this sort of celebration of the Bauhaus might actually continue uh, into something more, more uh, important. The main one was that they express their inner selves rather than conform to a style. I value only those artists who really are artists. That is who consciously or unconsciously in entirely original form embody the expression of, uh, oops. I knew this would happen. <laughs> well, I know it, it got on both sides of the sheet, and then I look. Let's forget it. <laughs> Just wing it, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's see, where was it? All right, it's expression. <laughs> uh, the, their inner life is work only for this end and cannot uh, do otherwise. They embraced all sorts of art. Th these were the, the artists, and you think of it at the time, before that, art was in the academy, it was in uh, wealthy people's houses, it was done portraits of wealth peop wealthy people, landscapes, and so on. These guys embraced the idea of folk art, children's art, 
and so-called primitive art, art from cultures other than our own. And so this is when this first started to happen, about 1911, and you think a long time ago, right? He also published uh, this, his major work concerning the spiritual in art, and it's difficult to overstate the importance of this work on shaping what we now know as modern art. It was extremely important uh, document, and I have the books here uh, that you know, so you can look at them. I find uh, this one very readable, Paul Clay's book. I had a lot of trouble trying to understand, but uh, he was always interested in the relationship of painting and music. A lot of his paintings, he, he, he developed a, a theories about how colors, um, certain colors relate to certain notes, and he took that quite far and did paintings that actually uh, create a, a, a system of those colors and so on, connecting uh, with musical pieces. There's a 12-tone uh, painting that, that uh, imitates uh, uh, Schoenberg's 12-tonal scale and so on. Uh, he also, he returned to Moscow after the Russian Revolution, but he was too much of a spiritualist. The, the revolutionaries were all atheists, and uh, he was uh, still uh, very involved with soul and spirit and so on. So, and, and, and then he uh, was invited to become one of the masters at the Bauhaus in about 1922. Uh, <clears throat> it was always a bit of a paradox, as he was a, par he was a champion of pure art, and not so much the practical arts that the Bauhaus uh, espoused. Uh, an example, it was th this being an example of the founder of the Bauhaus, Gropius's uh, tolerance of different points of view. He was eventually allowed to teach a class in pure painting with clay. And that was sort of his, his uh, big role, uh, big moment at the Bauhaus. Uh, Paul Clay. Let's see. Now let's let's go through some pictures of. Now I, I put this in here. This is about 1898, and this looks like a picture that could be shown in this gallery, mm -hmm. and uh, it shows where he started with his academy. It's a beautiful painting, actually, but um, and you already see these sort of flashes of, of intense color uh, spread around. But um, it was, it's a very early, so these are who he was doing when he was first uh, beginning to paint. Uh, lovely landscape. And then this, this painting in itself doesn't look like much, but this is actually Der Blue Rider. This is the painting that the group of avant-garde artists were named after and assembled around. Because it begins, it was, it was Partly, that we're looking a little bit at post-impressionist here, but he's beginning to do things with a landscape that are, that are fanciful and not real. And uh, that, as I say, the colors that were involved were also very symbolic and related to his, his sensitivity. Uh, again, probably post-impression influence. Um, lovely painting, a lot of reflection of water and so on, but also much more interested in the overall pattern and design of the, of the work rather than the, uh, than the representation of an object. We begin to see almost at this point some recognizable stuff. Uh, if you've seen a lot of his work, you might start to recognize this as a Paul Clay, but we're still only about 1908. Um, but the big bands and the buildings that are sort of blocks of color uh, become, or, or, or the beginning of his whole relationship with color. And then uh, 1909, this begins to really have the uh, sort of expressionist stylistic tendencies that um, uh, indicate a, an artist that was going to be uh, almost abstract in the end. He's using the elements in it as symbols rather than realistic elements. This is a, a cow. Um, you can sort of see the head of the cow in the lower right hand corner. But the rest is an opportunity to make uh, abstractions of shapes and colors. Uh, this is another version of a rider, much later now, uh, stylized and has changed the color of the rider from green to blue, or blue to green, I mean, and so on. 
And then finally, we're getting to improvisations that have no connection to realistic visions or, or, or views. And we're in about 1912 at this point. And other avant-garde artists were still working with a figure. Picasso at this point was doing figurative work. Um, this work was, uh, did not have uh, figures in it. It had elements that were based on a whole theory about color and shapes and which colors went with which shapes. And we're about pure abstraction. This is a, a study that you see a, a phenomenally influential uh, idea of these sort of various circles testing the relationships of different colors. And then somebody like Herbert on this print over here and Joseph Albers and so on took the idea of these relationships of colors and cleaned them up and did them in a much more precise way. But you can see the soulful way that Kandinsky uh, put these together. Um, now, we're still not at the Bauhaus. So all of this was happening before he gets to the Bauhaus. And then once he gets to the Bauhaus, you start to identify the, the more crisp edges to the forms, the more precise shapes, and so on, um, a pattern on white. And, and this, you know, you would say both probably recognizable as Kandinsky and as a painting that's, um, you know, related to the Bauhaus. Right? So his, his relationship to the other painters and the thinking in the other places were, were all part of that. Circles, um, the basic geometric forms that were, that were used. He, his role in the Bauhaus was the sort of master and head of painting. Another Bauhaus uh, drawing, uh, I mean painting. Various compositions. M all these sort of what we think of. I find when I thought this was very unusual. I mean, I'd, I'd seen a lot of his work and I didn't realize he had done anything like this. Quite extraordinary. <clears throat> Uh, after the war, um, the, the, the Bauhaus was dissolved and so on. And it looks, and it appears to me, he, he loosened up again. Uh, this is somewhat more surrealistic in shapes and, uh, and slightly more depressing in terms of color. I think you'll see both of these artists were affected after the war. There's some joy in this picture, but I think... In, the exuberance and optimism of the earlier work is, probably doesn't show. Okay, Paul Cleary, now I, I want to give these guys time to talk about, to start the discussion, so I'm going to be very quick. But um, <clears throat> he was born in Switzerland, 1876. Um, he again, began his studies at the academy. Uh, he had a very interesting thing in that his... Um, his earlier work, for a long time, he was intimidated by color. And here's a guy that now we associate fully with color. But in the beginning, he was intimidated by color. It's, it's hard to imagine. So he only drew. He, he only drew in, in, in pencil and for a long time and didn't actually engage in color until uh, these are some of the, the drawings that he did in the first part of his work until he got to, uh, became part of the Blue Rider group. And with the Blue Rider group, and this is that kind of artistic collaboration uh, with ideas uh, where you're, you're, you're bouncing ideas off other people, the important role that other people play in, in your work. And from the Blue Rider group, he got encouragement to engage color and reasons why to make things certain colors. And so you can see here a drawing where he's tentatively sort of putting little uh, color around the edges and uh, uh, until he sort of here totally embraces deep, rich, strong colors, 1914. All still pre-Bauhaus. Nothing if not color. The myth of the flower, right? Uh, combining, uh, again, the, the, the idea of the soul and the image uh, some of his joyful uh, pictures are these little, uh, sort of almost, you can see the influence of folk art in, in his background. Uh, 
portraits and drawings of faces, more recognizable images. The red balloon, again, um, one of his ideas was that it isn't just the shape of the object, but what the object is doing. So the red balloon, by its very nature, is lifting. Um, and and it, it has a quality to it that is beyond just looking at a balloon. Um, a drawing in the later period, rather marvelous one, didn't abandon that. He always had a bit of a kind of a humor caricature interest in the deformed and so on. And here's a, a picture at the Bauhaus where that he made while he was at the Bauhaus, again with patterns of color and all based on the rather uh, obscure philosophy that he espoused in his book. Um, this was done, interestingly enough, we're looking at some of the later work. By the way, he did 9,000 paintings in his lifetime. Uh, he did a lot of them after the Bauhaus. Uh, this was during the war, 1937. And you can see the political content in this. This is uh, the, 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 uh, march, the revolution of the viaducts. Where the, the, it was the, the soldiers, uh, Nazi soldiers, that he was referring to here. He was hounded by the Nazis. He went to, retreated to Switzerland, where he finished his life. But continued the, the connection with um, the, 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 the soul. And here we have uh, the angel of death. He's about to die, 1940. And uh, <coughs> death and fire, maybe the last painting he made. You can see the imagery there. OK, thanks for indulging me in this. Uh, I find these paintings so important and moving. Uh, and I, just the pleasure of reviewing them and, and uh, preparing for this talk um, <coughs> allowed me to engage them. I've included a couple of more artists. I'll go quickly, partly because uh, Dick communicated with Amy that uh, he was influenced by uh, Laszlo Mahali Nagy. And so we've included just a couple of other people who were in the, the Bauhaus that did paintings. So here are some examples of their work. We won't go into their biography. Joseph Albers, uh, famous for his explorations of color and relations of color, did hundreds of prints. This one actually happened when I was at Yale. It was created when I was uh, at the school. He was uh, at the school with Amy Albers, still in New Haven. And uh, now, uh, I'd love to. <laughs> wow. Turn the mic over to our okay. esteemed uh, artist crew here, and um, you let them. The, um, Do you want the mic? Need the mic? No, I don't need the mic. Okay. The keyboard. I'll, I'll project. Just to advance your slides, or we're going to oh. stay there. Right ahead. Can you give me responsibility? The arrow. The arrow. on the bottom. Oh, the one on the bottom right. right. Those guys. Okay. Uh, I'll just give you a quick. Or I can do it. You want to see your mouse and just. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. That's too much responsibility for me. <laughs> just a little background. Uh, I was introduced to the Bauhaus in 1974 when I purchased this book which turned out to be hugely important for me because at one point I was an pro assistant professor of art and I had to teach color theory. So I stayed a week ahead of the students. <laughs> but this book is really phenomenal. And then I went, on, uh, went online to Amazon and now at this, you know, you can see I took really good care of it, but I used it. What's and the now that? It's called uh, The Art of Color by Johannes Itten. And, um, just this this book is would still be very valuable for anybody that's exploring you know, art and color. I mean, there's it's profound. Um, so the Bauhaus to me was primarily uh, the the 
the influence on my work came more from the architecture of the Bauhaus. And I think there'll be a piece that uh, we'll, we'll see here. And I wasn't, uh, is this it? Or well, that's, that's what, that, that is one. And um, you can see the architectural references in there. Um, the other thing that, that's been important in my work and is still important, and I don't know where the Bauhaus fits into this, but surface, attention to detail of surface, and the fact that my paintings are primarily constructed as opposed to painted. Like this piece is made with uh, pigmented wood putty so that all the color that one sees is embedded in the work and there, it's not color applied to a surface, it's, it's actually embedded. The, the dots are drilled and filled. Um, at one point I wanted to be a dentist when I was very young. So <laughs> the drilling and filling, I finally realized. So, <laughs> you know, all this comes around when you start thinking about it, or to me it does anyway. Um, so, but um, I, I don't think anybody can approach art that, that works in a more minimal way, and much of my work is, without thinking about the Bauhaus and its, and its influence. And, um, and then I was just thinking when I was listening to, what's his name? Aaron. 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> I told you I had trouble with people. Um, I, I was thinking it's, it's interesting to me that Dada was going on about the same time. And I think that I, I haven't read anything comparing the two and what was happening there, but um, Dada, I think, was more important to me, at least in my last 20 years <coughs> in my first 30 years of making work. Um, and so this, this, this piece on the right is 10 feet by 8 feet, and my colors are, have been very limited to a palette that had never, I had never explored colors like that. And I, I had collectors and friends look at that and they were just shocked. They just, how can you do that? But um, the, 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 that piece on the right, those panels are cast pigmented beeswax. Mm -hmm. So uh, it goes through a process of starting as a solid, becomes a liquid, and then it's transformation of materials and then goes back to a solid. And then, um, I mean, I, the piece on the left, the, the circle's been profound in my work. Uh, I mean, the circle, to me, is a, f a form or a shape that cannot be improved upon. I mean, it's absolutely flawless. And uh, whether it's a sphere or a two-dimensional ring. And so I have, I keep returning to that in my work for, I don't know, three decades. And also the grid. And so when, when I look at that, I think of Albers and you know how he organized his shapes on his canvases or his prints. Uh, oh, yeah, and when I realized I was going to be part of this panel, I thought I'd better read a little bit about uh, the Bauhaus <laughs> and catch up. And one of the really interesting things I, I found out was that Gropius, who was the originator of this, he started it, married Mahler's widow. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, there's something there. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think that uh, that's pretty much what I have to say about <laughs> my interaction with Bauhaus. So when, when you're picking colors, though, like for this, are you just doing it intuitively? Or you oh, that's, I, I, I was going to mention that. Is that... It, I'll repeat the question. Uh, Harry was asking if my color selection was intuitive or more scientific, I guess one would say. And, or methodical. Or methodical. And now, what I'm doing now is completely intuitive. I've decided, in, and this is fairly recent, maybe in the past few years, that um, I reflect on it after I do it more than before I do it. And it's not as though I have a huge range that I draw from. It's, it's, I've, I've already condensed my selection of colors to a very small amount of, of color to work with. But when I pick it, it's, it's intuitive. 
thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. That's pretty exciting because it's informing you back, which yeah. is pretty cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah that, that's pretty cool. Well, that, that, no, your, your comment is good because I think my work is more informing me now yeah. than it ever has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I find that to be, uh, number one, trusting my intuition and then realize this, frick, but my work has changed. Like this piece on the left, again, is a pigmented wood putty piece. And the surface is, as my father would say, smooth as a nun's knee. Because I, I sand it with uh, very fine sandpaper at the end. And so when I'm finished with that piece, I cannot violate that surface. Or, I have, or it becomes something entirely different. And I, I work this way for years, like a decade. And so um, a huge change when I, in my working process recently where the work evolves, I go back, I tear things up. It, it's just much freer the way I look at it and more open. And, and I'm letting that intuition work for me. All right. Well, this is me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The end. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history, and I'm, I apologize for name dropping, but I can't help it, because I was born into the new Chicago Bauhaus, literally. Uh, my father and mother were, uh, an ar he was an architect, she, was, she ran a, a Scandinavian design store. Uh, the students from IIT would come over and hang out with my parents because there was nothing modern in Chicago after the war. Um, and so they were sort of the, they were, they were um, very seminal in, in creating a gathering place. And I have a, a wild story that Lazo Maholi Nagi, Maholi Naj, Maholi Nagi. I mean, they, he was pronounced in many different ways. But my parents called him Maholi Nagi. Uh, he came over to dinner one night with Serge Chemayev and Georgie Kepish was somewhere. And, and we were very young, and my sister and I were remembering this today. They got into a very heated argument, and one of them, and I think it might have been Serge, grabbed a knife off the table and chased Maholi Nagi into the living room, brandishing this knife. And my mother, who was statuesque, but very soft-spoken, followed them into the living room and somehow broke this up and there was no blood drawn, but the point is, they felt that passionate about their ideas around design and art and architecture. And it was uh, very noticeable as a young girl that um, people cared this much. And <clears throat> so my father went on to Cranbrook, and he was great friends with Charles and Ray Eames, and Alexander Gerard, and all of that crowd. And so I was surrounded <laughs> by mid-century modernism. We grew up in a very sparse house with modern furniture. And it's, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I <laughs> ended up going to art school. So um, my, I, I make a parallel between Cranbrook and the Bauhaus, even though it's not really talked about. Mm -hmm. Because Cranbrook had that same idea of learn all sorts of crafts, weave, make pots, uh, make sculpture, design furniture, all of that informs whatever discipline you're doing and makes it um, more interesting and more broad. And, and, and there was this wonderful um, um, <coughs> merge, merging between all these disciplines. So, you know, I think today about um, a painter working with a, a, a lighting designer or a sculptor working with an architect. I think these are so important, and you don't see that much happening these days. We've gotten so specialized. But nonetheless, how I can say, I mean, obviously the Bauhaus influenced me because I, I sort of have the DNA. But, but when I look at my work, um, this is a monoprint uh, wood block on the bottom and a monoprint with, with watercolor and a monoprint with uh, oil-based ink on top, and it's from a series called Twisted Rain, which is about 
what's happening today, you know, and this beautiful parasol holding up or out or in all, everything that's going on. So for me, mm. there's, a, there's a very intuitive, I am a very intuitive person, so I don't approach my work from an intellectual uh, place, but more of a place of poetry. And nature is my muse. Even though I have a very, if you go to the next slide, I have a strong um, design aesthetic. Uh, I also design rugs that Tibetans weave in Nepal. And so this is part of that textile, uh, bringing textile in. This, um, this has been a really interesting project for me because they're paintings in, in a sense, and yet I'm collaborating with some of the finest weavers in the world, and I love that I can take that away from my own, you know, collaborating for me is, is really a joy, because you're not, your ego is not involved, you can put your intellectual head aside, all sorts of interesting accidents happen. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is more, and all of a sudden, you know, this circle keeps showing up. For me, the circle, we all know about some of us know about the meditative calligraphic ensho that came from China and then went to Japan, which is really an exercise in breathing. And yes, it's a perfect uh, moment, but I also love that it's the void and it's what's inside, that it's solid and it's void. And um, I find that very magical. Uh, it includes everything and nothing. So I, I work uh, on that on a sort of more spiritual level because it's such a mystery to me. So for me, um, I make work because I'm always seeking, I always want to know, I'm trying to increase my connection with something bigger than me. And I so appreciate my Bauhaus background because I'm sure that I know that I, I do have a, a strong sense of design coming, you know, from from that. So. But see, both both so far have talked about these things that actually are expressed in these two books that I didn't know about until I started studying Kandinsky and Clay. Mm -hmm. But they wrote about exactly what you're talking about: the sacredness of the circle, the void in the middle, the the, the sense that that has that objects and forms. Clay was called, his title at the Bauhaus was Formmeister. That was his <laughs> job. And, and so he, would, he they analyzed and thought so hard and argued about it. So I think what, what is interesting is obviously we use these things and they're, they're, they're powerful. We've discovered them on their own. But it might be really interesting to sort of dig and sort of see why, where, where it came from, from some of these other guys that preceded us a long time. All right, Dick. Okay, <coughs> well, um, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as many of you know, I worked for Herbert Byer for many years in the mm -hmm. 70s, and uh, that happened completely by accident. I moved here, I was working construction, I just wanted to live in Aspen, my wife and I. Uh, Louder? Sorry. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, so we wound up here. I worked in structure for about a year. Uh, I, by chance, ran into someone who said that Herbert Byer was looking for an assistant. I didn't know who Herbert Byer was. I went to the library, which is where I learned everything I know about art, really. And, uh, and you know, it was, wow, shit, man, bow house. So I went and interviewed with him, and I got a job with him, and it was a great, great uh a great break for me. So uh, I worked for, for about on and off for about seven years, five years pretty straight. Uh, every day we'd go up to Red Mountain, <coughs> work in the studio. I worked on just, was I was so scared. I was scared shitless to work for him, I swear to God. Because I just, you know, I was 26 years old. This guy's like 70 year old Bauhaus master. It was very intimidating. And I, <coughs> I had a fair amount of confidence in my own work then. I was doing very <coughs> geometric work at the time. Started in New Jersey painting work that was very geometric uh, uh, constructions and uh, reliefs. And so uh, there was a lot of simpatico between you know, our approach to art, which 
made me a lot more comfortable. But um, so I spent a lot of time, and, and I had the uh, pleasure of his library, which included the Eiten book and uh, and an Albers book, and uh, uh, so I learned a lot about color just from having access to that, and also from the day to day. Uh, painting that we did in the studio every day. It was nine to five. And, uh, and if it wasn't on paintings, it was on maquettes for tapestries or architecture or whatever. I mean, it was a constant, constant. Uh, and in those, at that time, his work was obsessed with uh, chromatic scales of color. So, um, but you know, I was doing my own work. And I gotta say, uh, as much as I loved working for him, his work really did not influence me. Uh, I was talking to Tim about this today, and uh, I mean, the influences on me were more, well, uh, Mahali Nagi was, if you're talking about the Biles, was the guy who really influenced me. He, I feel uh, a soul attachment to him. So what about, what about that, where his work was really? Well, I, I, uh, I am a, uh, <laughs> I am a clean freak. I'm very fastidious. My studio is very organized. Uh, that kind of geometry appeals to my psyche. I just, you know, I... Um, but Herbert wasn't exactly messy. <laughs> Herbert was not messy. <laughs> no. No, he, was, <laughs> he came dressed and worked on a Persian carpet. I've told that story before. But anyway, uh, so, you know, yes, Kandinsky was informative. Uh, Clay, not really at all for me. Uh, but um, the... Uh, the more geometric stuff of right. Kandinsky was important, but at that time I wasn't as interested in I felt his work was really romantic, Kandinsky, it as, was. as opposed to Molly Nage, which was, you know, really the future of the Bauhaus. Uh, everything at the Bauhaus eventually reflected that. It got very technical, uh, it was all about architecture after a while, and uh, it was an incredible change over the 13 years that the school was open. So. Um, but really, you know, I had just moved out from New Jersey in 1970, and uh, I had just seen a show at the Metropolitan Museum <clears throat> that was curated by Henry Galzeller, and it was about the New York School. And, uh, you know, I mean, you had uh, Albers in that show, Frank Stella, and uh, Kenneth Noland, and uh, people who were also doing geometry. And to me, that was way more influential. And so my work was really influenced by uh, another sphere but not to take away from the fact that working uh, for Herbert Beyer every day didn't have an influence. I mean, I learned how to mix paint. Right. But <laughs> those guys you just mentioned, the minimalists, were heavily influenced by the Bauhaus too. So Absolutely, it's a, yeah. It's a yeah. generation or two after right. the waves are still right. washing right. into the shore. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> where was I? So anyway, I. Uh, I, it was, I was working as an assistant, but it was an opportunity to learn a lot of things. I had never worked on architecture. I had never worked on tapestries. I never made prints. I was a pretty good painter at the time. But um, so I would work for him to nine to five, and then I'd go to my studio on the West End. I had a really shitty studio in a barn, and, uh, but it had no water, no heat. And uh, so, you know, it was just a real indulgent uh, uh, time for me to just work all day, every day. And, um, and then to be associated with him, I got to meet a lot of people who really uh, you know, made me realize, and I, could, I think you can say this about everybody at the Bauhaus, that uh, they were workaholics. The, the work was incredibly important to them. They just worked and worked and worked. And they had a lot of fun too, but they, they, uh, they were committed. And uh, I found uh, working for Bayer, you know, I'd go there at uh, nine o'clock in the morning and he'd be there. He'd obviously been there for a while. And uh, he'd take a long lunch and then I'd come back uh, or leave at you know, six o'clock at night and he'd still be there. Uh, so I mean, it was like, this guy's 70 years old. I mean, he's really putting it down. So I, it was a lesson in what it was gonna take to you know, sort of make it as an artist. And uh, the other thing was that, excuse me for a second. The other thing was that, uh, and this is true of the Bauhaus in general, was the multidisciplinary attachment uh, or approach to art. You know, he was a painter and I was primarily doing his paintings, but we had projects for, uh, you know, everything. I mean, he was uh, a design consultant for Atlantic Crisfield at the time, so we did, you know, 
they built a 50-story building in LA. We did carpets, tapestries, murals, uh, all kinds of stuff for those buildings. Uh, he did things, obviously, for the Institute in Washington, Berlin, uh, something in Alaska, I believe, um, in here. And so, you know, it was just like he would come in and say, oh, we got to work on this now, you know, let's forget what you're doing or whatever. And, uh, and uh, so it was just, you know, and what you know about the Bauhaus is that they encouraged everybody to do everything. You know, find what you want, but you need to branch out. You, you know, you can't get stuck and think you're in a place, no artist can do this, get stuck and think that you've got it now because you don't. I mean, it's, it's a constant learning thing. So uh, I think that was really the biggest thing that that school brought to art education. When you think about it, uh, there probably isn't an art education uh, department in any university in the country or in the world, maybe that hasn't been influenced by Bauhaus. It's all multidisciplinary, you have beginning courses, you indulge in a lot of different things. And that's incredibly important to be able to, you know, stick your face in other things and, and see, how, uh, see how well you do. And I mean, it proved very valuable to me because, you know, uh, painting, I've been painting all my life. I'm, I'm compulsive, I paint a lot and uh, very prolific. And, uh, but I, uh, you know what, there was one point in the, in the 80s I had to get a job. I was just broke. It was just like, we had just moved to California, it was awful, and I, I got a job working on a film crew. And that became like a 35-year project for me as I became, a, worked into it being a production designer. And that was another example of being scared shitless. You know, you get hired to do something that you don't really know how to do, but you do it. You know, you just figure out how to do it. And I just admired that about the, uh, the Bauhaus and that, that that sort of information that that's, you know, this is what it's gonna take. And um, anyway, that was the big takeaway from Bauhaus for me. So, hi, everybody. I'm um, Kelly. I am a graphic designer and a surface designer. I've been working um, for about 30, 33 years doing that. Um, I was I was not influenced, well, I was influenced by the Bauhaus, but I, was, I did not know about the Bauhaus until I came to Aspen in the 80s. Um, and I grew up in a small provincial town in Ontario, Canada. Um, and, you know, really, um, did not, I did not study art in college. Um, I became a graphic designer a little bit by accident because I really you know, learned to love type and became a typesetter and then became a graphic designer. Um, and so for me, um, like Chris, I knew I was gonna be on this panel, I did a little more research. And over this past year, since the Bauhaus 100's been happening in Aspen, I've read about it. I went to the exhibit at the Historic Museum, and um, I feel like I'm meeting these hundred-year-old friends that I didn't know about before. Um, and it's great to get to know them because I, I'm clearly I've clearly been influenced by them, um, and uh, just absolutely love um, color and pattern. Um, I, I, I was a graphic designer before I became a pattern designer, um, and I got into pattern design um, out of a desire to, I started a little stationary company that then became a, basically a surface design company, um, but I, I wanted to be my own client. I was, I had, we, <laughs> Margaret was my partner for many years. We um, actually designed a lot of things that the client never picked, and we didn't like that. And so we decided, <laughs> yeah, I decided I'd like to maybe you know, create some patterns and uh, body of work that, that I could take a different direction, and I did. I went into um, this, uh, what well, I started IOTA, which was a surface design company stationary. We went into products. We had... Um, women's accessories, baby accessories, and stationery. Um, and um, so designing patterns for me is really, um, it's really my, my first love. Uh, and these are just some examples of, um, of the patterns I've done. Um, you know, clearly 
influenced by, by the Bauhaus, um, even though I didn't know it at the time. Uh, abstract patterns, very colorful. Everything that I, everything I designed was done in a palette of nine colors, um, which I did instinctively, um, but turns out it was a good idea, <laughs> design-wise. <laughs> um, and so these are some abstract patterns, and then just I did, I've done a lot of patterns that were influenced by everyday life, mostly domestic life. Um, these are a couple of, oh, oh, no, that's okay. These are a couple of examples of my graphic design that I feel were very influenced by the Bauhaus. Um, the iconic Berko calendar packaging, um, you know, really, you know, played with type um, that is, is Helvetica, actually. You know what this is saying, though, is that the, it, this information is communicated visually. Yeah. That, that, that it's not all about words or philosophy. The, the, the artists that I showed you were deep philosophers and thinkers, and they communicated their work and codified it, but the information for artists gets passed on visually. It's a whole another language. And what, what, what you're saying, Kelly, is you, you saw all this and assimilated it and, and, it, and, uh, and used it and recreated it, which is very, very Bauhaus for practical reasons, right? So. Yeah, and I, you know, the more I learned about it, the loving lowercase, I write everything in lowercase. I, but that was just such a great discovery. Um, the, you know, the love of color, the, the sort of practical, pragmatic um, design. I, a lot of my patterns do have a lot of methodology and math in them because they have to be tiled to repeat, to print on fabric. Um, so there is a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of math there. Um, and then the, this is the original Aspen Ideas Festival uh, branding. I actually worked on it with Margaret. Uh, the, f the very first year, 2000, Five was directly influenced by the Bauhaus, um, even the palette. But then, for the next few years, we just we sort of went sideways with the colors and had some fun with it. Um, and you know, the other thing I discovered, I, I love to sew, and I grew up, you know, doing macrame, and I was a painter and a weaver, and um, so again, just that, that multidisciplinary approach to making art and making and always making. And I'm glad you mentioned the workaholic thing because I got that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and you're, you're thoroughly Bauhaus and that a lot of your work is practical. I mean, that, that was the other, the sort of original intent was to bridge fine art with practical art. And here you are embodying exactly that principle which is a deep Bauhaus principle, whether you like it or not. Well, and, and I, do love, I do love that about my graphic design practice because, you know, I'm working for clients and they have problems they need yeah. to have solved and um, I do approach it very pragmatically and I really tr try to put the ego away and listen to them about what they need and what they want. And um, so I, I really feel like I have been influenced and, um, and I'm very excited to learn more about, about all of my influences. <laughs> so let's... So we a little over time, but we started late. So right. that doesn't count. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> so. But if anybody needs to leave, fine, but we're going to yeah. continue. Uh, any, any thoughts, questions for our panelists? Yes, Michael. So a lot of what I read about with Bauhaus you know, mentions the word collaboration. Uh, collaboration has become a um, watchword in the last 20 years to the point that it has been rendered meaningless in many ways. So I wonder what the practical manifestations, either in Bauhaus and uh, in your particular work of collaboration, what's that collaboration, what's that really look like as a practical matter? So um, I'm, I'm just going to answer first that there, is, there are a lot of paradox and contradictions in the Bauhaus. Right? <laughs> and that they had both people that, that were collaborating and collaborators. And then there were these two artists I just showed you 
who are talking about the individual artist being true to their individual soul, right? So <laughs> the great thing about the Bauhaus is that it embraced lots of different points of view. It wasn't scared of a debate. It had lots of arguments, and there were there were there was a lot of uh, you know and that night <laughs> fights, <laughs> <laughs> fights <laughs> that about, right? so, so <clears throat> they were passionate about what they did, but so uh, there was plenty of collaboration going on. There was a lot of work that was done. Uh, Clay, uh, his workshops always had lots of collaboration. They did a uh, wall painting exercises, all the buildings, the interiors of the Bauhaus were painted by students collaborating on works of art and so on. So there was a bunch of that. But there was also, in, 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 at the opposite side, you know, this, this sort of it, celebration of the individual yeah. artist mm -hmm. and the individual artist's soul. So you have to work that one out for yourself. Yeah. It created, <laughs> but, so it created that, quite a yeah. um, division between Kandinsky and Clay and the rest of Gropius and the others. There was quite a schism because the painters were going in that other direction. And uh, yeah. I don't think they ever resolved it. Well, but I, yeah, they started. didn't resolve a lot. I mean, because there was the, the whole idea to keep things moving. And, and as, <coughs> as was expressed earlier, I think Dick was saying that, you know, you don't, you don't stop. The, the idea is to keep moving, right? So, so there, and a, an idea is, is not a, a stopping point. It's a, it's, a, it's a point to continue from. You know, but all, all art's a collaboration anyway. You, right. you may work alone in the studio and do things, but you know, you are, you have assistants sometimes. I was an assistant, an assistant for a long time. I mean, you get to a point where if you have enough money, you get an assistant just because the work is, is hard. And so you have people, you know, building stretchers for you. You have dealers you deal with. You have clients you have to deal with. Uh, shipping, packing, all that crap. I mean, it's, it's work, and, and so you have to deal with it like it's small business. As, as one, one artist in LA once said to me, it's light industry, and he was kind of right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, in the bigger sense, the bigger picture of collaboration, I think is really, I feel, I mentioned it before, that I feel a loss right now, today, of the fact that we aren't, I mean, how many of these salons do we go to, and how many times do we get together and actually talk about ideas, we used to all do it in art school, but I don't know how many artists in here as adults. I really, I, I miss that. I hope, I'm hoping for, for it to, you know, for us to, to find a, a new conversation or a new way to well, do that. Maybe this is the start of that. that <laughs> I'm curating a show at the launch pad in July that works on paper with sculptor, architect, landscape architect, ceramicist, painter, printmaker, and physicist mm. with the hope. I mean, we'll see. It might be a total disaster. But, <laughs> you know, the hope that, I mean, there's an opportunity to bring together these maybe not so like-minded people, but you, you weave the connection through the actual medium. So that's like another way to approach. So a couple more questions. Yes. Uh, what is the significance of mathematics the knowledge either formally or self-taught in your work. Do you all have a mathematical background? In order to do well, I can tell you, I, uh, I went to college to be an engineer. This is a really stupid story, but I had a, I had a substitute uh, guidance counselor in high school when I went to get to talk about where I was going to go to college, and I had terrible grades in math and science, and really good grades in the humanities, and he told me he thought I'd make a great engineer. <laughs> so I went to engineering school. I lasted uh, literally a semester. I could not do calculus. I mean, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. But the, the uh, most important, I never took an art class ever, except in high school I took mechanical drawing for a, a year. And really, that was the basis of my making art. It still is today. So I use those tools. I'm very hands-on with that kind of stuff. So I'm not good at math, but I can use a ruler. <laughs> there's there's a lot of math involved in graphic design, um, and I use it yeah every day. But is it self-taught, or were you a formal math major, or what? No, I studied religion. Um, I did not even study art. Um, I was always good in math. Um, I love math, but um, and and I love I love math as it relates to 
making things repeat and um, you know understanding how it works in graphic design, but um, no, I wasn't formally trained in that. Well, but you worked for an architect, right? Fires. Fire was uh, an artist. He was an architect. He was a, <coughs> yes. He was all those things. And you're a contractor. So I am. <laughs> Matt, is all, but you, you did no, listen, uh, let me just say this. Everything I do, every painting I've ever made, every approach to art is based on science and math, okay? When I say I'm not good at it, I can't do calculus, but I can. I, the visuals of math to me are like when you look at a great cathedral. I mean, it's just, it's so it informs everything I do, really. But I'm just not a mathematician. Would you say it's an intuitive thing? That you just see math? Where you are, like an orchestration you know, you will, or something. I'm here. just naturally drawn to those kinds of things that involve geometry and math. Yes, yeah. Physics, particle physics played a big part in my work for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just say one yeah. observation I had from my guests this evening? All of you have said something, not literally, but you've all said the same thing. And that is, you're inspired to do what you're going to do. You do it, and if you need a tool, you go find out about it, you investigate it, you put it in your toolbox. You're learners. And that's what's keep keeping you guys going in the cycle of going forward, of advancing. Of, I just wanted to say that. It's totally true. Whether it's math or no matter what it is, those are tools that you use. And if you don't know it, you find out. No fear. <laughs> Remember that. Well, I think, we're, I think we're all interested in solving problems. Mm -hmm. which is what our work is. Mm -hmm. Every day, there's one, one is confronted with what, what's going to happen. And, um, but you're right. It's, it's, it keeps us engaged. And I think it's exploration. I mean, the journey. OK. Well, one more question? <laughs> one more? Yeah, David. What, um, what was the era for Bauhaus? Replace it, or where did we move from Bauhaus to where it is? Well, the Bauhaus ended uh, Saturday. It started about 1919. 1919. 1919. 1919. And ended at, at, you know, basically the Nazis shut it down. 1933. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the period. What happened afterwards was one of the reasons it's so prominent and prevalent in the world is that that dispersed the talent and the brains and the thinking of the Bauhaus all over the world. And so it had the opposite effect in the, the Nazis in, the in their attempt to shut down these radical ideas actually blew hard on the dandelion seed and yeah. spread those seeds all over the world. And that's why we're talking about this today here. <laughs> There's a lesson in immigration there because Germany lost vast amount of intellectual knowledge because of the Nazis. And they a lot of them landed here and we were the beneficiary of that. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You, you, you yeah, my grandfather, Sterner Dravis, a student of Peter Ski Clay and both in Weimar and Bessau of the Bauhaus. And uh, he came in 1930 um, feeling the uprisings of politics and was one of the founding members of the American Abstract Artist Movement in New York. And so it was a big group of people in New York, only not was in Chicago. Um, all of us ended up being in the Black Mountain College in North yeah, Carolina. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have them all going yeah. up, you know. Yeah. And so, and Herbert, yeah. what was your Herbert here? Yeah. Baroner Dreyfus, do you know the name? Yeah. In, in the English, it would look like Werner Drews, D R E W E S. All right. Thank you for Thank coming. You.